Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, we're just trying to adjust something so we can hear ourselves. We didn't hear what Sam said to you guys, so it's a little bit difficult for us. Can't you hear us either? Is that better? Okay, good. All right. So we need to eat this thing before it hears us. Okay, I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for coming to this meeting today. And just like to give a little bit of background before we proceed. I'm sure you're aware of the what uh, happened at the meeting we had at Northside Community Church, I think it was the end of July, um, where we had New State Partners and the Minister of Finance, and they presented an offer to us. Uh, Okay, well, yeah, we're struggling to hear, but... Yeah. Yeah, no, it's okay for you guys, but we can't hear anything up here. Speakers, sounds all going that way. So, anyway, the offer that they presented... Um, for most of us, in fact, probably all of us, felt it was a bit of an insult to be honest. And um, so we as a committee obviously were not going to pursue something that was totally unacceptable. And since that time we've worked tirelessly to try and uh, work with government to come up with something that is at least uh, an offer that maybe we can look at. And on Friday afternoon last week we got an offer from them which on the paper, and it's, it's, it's in writing, signed by the minister himself. Um, the offer itself, which we will present to you by itself, is not worth going for. But we have, over the weekend, had um, interaction with the Aaron Fox uh, team in Washington. I'm sh I'm sh if you are not aware of who they are, they are probably one of the top law firms in the United States who have um, uh, come to support us and help us raise the finances and guide us through some legal pitfalls and challenges. They've had a good look at it and they've come back with some suggestions, proposals that they feel that if we can get government to agree to and include in, in what they're proposing, it may be something that could be acceptable to us. The purpose of the meeting today, and I did put it out on the group, we're not having a definitive vote to decide this is what we are accepting and take it or leave it. We're trying to gauge opinion from farmers across the country and those overseas. So those of you who are joining us by Zoom, please send us your feedback. We have, are, are facing a position where either we stop now because this is exhausting and it's, yeah, we don't want to just carry on with something that's not going to have the backing of the farmers, but at the same time, um, so, so we need to get some feedback from farmers today on three main topics, uh, um, which are kind of all linked together. So the first, obviously, is to look at the proposal and the um, suggestions the, that have come back from Aaron Fox as to how we can make sure that it works for us and not against us. So I'm going to hand over to once to Harry first, who will pr go through what the minister presented to us, and um, and and also some of the stuff that came back from Aaron Fox. Uh, uh, so anyway, we're going to work together as a team here. And before uh, before I I just want to say these two men on my left have worked tirelessly on behalf of all of us to try and work a way to get some money for us. 
They have given up so much of their own time. They've taken so much flack and so much abuse, not only from some of our own constituency, but from people in the ministry that they have to deal with on an ongoing basis. And so I just want to say, Harry and Charlie, thank you for all the work that you put on, on our behalf. We're just so grateful to you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Please excuse me for not standing. I'll do it better sitting down. I just want to elaborate on what uh, Andy has just said about that first proposal. And it, it, it's concerning to us that people jump the gun. Um, they have the view that we have a mandate to, to negotiate on behalf of the farmers and accept deals for the farmers. I want to assure everybody here that we do not have that mandate and that the, the, the proposal that was put forward the 1% 20-year bond. I don't know how many meetings we had with the minister to highlight to him that this is going to be unacceptable. There's no ways in hell that guys were going to go along with this thing. And sure enough, uh, he did address the meeting. I think he got a very good vibe that it wasn't going well. Um, Charlie and myself and Andy went and, and Nick went and saw the vice president to brief him that the offer of 1% is going to be rejected and there was no way forward. So we, put up, we, we came up with another solution to, to, the, to the Vice President, and we proposed to him a, 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 a bond of 350 million, a 10% bond, a 10 bond on, of, on the 3.5 billion, which was $350 million. And we, what we said to him, we said, if you are prepared to issue a bond at a 10% uh, coupon rate, those could be traded because it's, an, it's, a, it's a, an attractive bond. And farmers would then have a choice of um, either cashing in, trading them. They would have taken a haircut, but not as big as a haircut uh, on this 1%. That 1% was a junk, uh, is a junk bond. That no, no one would have touched that. Uh, he bought into that. Uh, he actually indicated to us at that meeting that he didn't, suspect, he didn't expect the farmers to accept this. And he had indicated to the uh, Minister of Finance that he doubted very much whether the farmers would go along with that first proposal. So we had, we had meetings with the minister. We proposed this to him. He accepted it. He said, let's, let's work on it. A team was put together. And they've changed, they've changed it a bit. They don't want to issue a bond. And the reason why they don't want to issue a bond is that if everybody takes those bonds and trades them, he's in, he's in the hole for $350 million. And he hasn't got it. So what he's proposing now is a cash payment of 10% of the 350 million of the global, global compensation bill. A cash payment will be paid over a period of three years with an interest rate of 5% per annum. The remaining balance, which would be $295 million dollars, would be paid in the fourth year. The farm owners, and this is a, a, a big, a big, I believe, a big, um, uh, I'm thinking the right word, the deed of sessions, that we do not have to sign the deed of sessions. And this has been a big bugbear, because every time we've gone to them and, and proposed something, they're insisting that the deed of sessions be signed. They have now conceded that no deed of sessions to be signed for the first four years and only if government performs. If government doesn't perform, Charles will, will elaborate on, on uh, a paper that was given to us by our lawyers in Washington, and he'll explain that aspect of it. So the deal is 335 million a year, paid first payment in January of this year, second payment in July. It will be treated as an IR payment. We haven't, we haven't agreed yet if, if Farmers accept this. We haven't agreed yet on how that's going to be dispersed, but we'll have to come up with a mechanism to, to, to see how best get, get those funds to the farmers. This money will be paid anywhere in the world. So the guys who are outside of this country and, and, and wish to partake in this exercise will be paid in their account in Australia, UK, wherever they are, and anybody here who wants those funds paid out of this country will be paid outside of this country in a hard currency. 
So I want to put to bed this, this thing about, you know, where the deep doesn't specifically say anywhere in the world. That is going to happen. It will be paid out to your account anywhere you want and you choose. For the balance of the 3.5 billion, and this is where there's a bit of an issue, they want to issue another bond in, in year six. And our, con our concern is that we don't want to be tied down to a bond of any sorts. If, if government performs in the first four years and they don't find the funds, the, the, the 3.1 billion that would be outstanding, we could be locked in for another 15 16 years and that is a big concern to us and that's why we engaged with our lawyers in in, uh, in Washington and they've come up with some very good suggestions which we believe uh, would be acceptable and we'll make sure that that is put into a legal document um, prior to us coming back to you and getting your ratification. What they have conceded is that the TBs will be issued at a minimum of 1% coupon prescribed uh, Prescribed asset status, in other words, you can trade, you can liquidate those, those bonds, and they are tradable. Very debatable whether we could do those three on, on a 1% uh, bond. So it's a big question mark, but Charles will elaborate on, on, on that. Government has agreed that they will sell assets to, to, try, to, to try and settle this bill. Their, their intention, they tell us, is that they want this issue put to bed within that four-year period. In other words, full and final payment to every single farmer. They are proposing that, they, that the asset that they have given us in Kovimba Mining, that we, that we liquidate our shares, we own 12.5% of that. I've actually even went further and said, if you can find a buyer, we'll sell the whole thing. They'll sell the whole group and uh, Dis disperse those funds. The problem we have with, with uh, Kavimba uh, Holdings is that, and we raised it with, um, uh, with the minister, we had, a, we had a buyer, a Canadian buyer, a year ago, who was very interested in taking up this offer. Uh, most of you are probably aware that one of the principals or shareholders in Kavimba is on a listed, is, is a listed entity and the Canadians walked away from that. They couldn't be seen to be involved with a, with a, a group that's listed, who's sanctioned. So they walked away from that. And I, I raised it with the minister, and he assured me that that, that issue has been, a, has been dealt with. He didn't elaborate whether they brought him out, whether they told him to go home, I don't know. But he says that it can be sold now and there won't be a problem there. Debatable, we can't get, Andy sits, Andy sits on that board, um, and we're having a hard time getting correct financials and assets. You know, wh what is Kavimba worth? He claims it's worth 1.5 billion. Um, we need to see the numbers and the balance sheets and, and, the, and the gold reserves that they have to warrant uh, a group of 1.5 billion. All the payments that were made under IR3, IR1, IR2, and IR3 will be deducted from, from your, your, your claim. That, that was a gift. We've always known that. That's not, that's not an issue. And I don't think it's going to be a hell of a lot of money. By the time we got that money, um, when they first put the 2.5 billion in, if they'd paid it out there and then, you would have got 20,000 US dollars. At the end, we all, we all, I think we ended up with about two by the time they paid that out. So it's not a, it's not a big issue, that one. And, and we've accepted that any IRA payments would, would be credited or debited to the account. That's basically, Charles, what I've got to say, Chairman. Um, I think we'll take questions at the end. I'll hand it over to Charles. Thank you, Harry. Can I? We share glasses and try to pause. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for um, coming to listen to us. Um, I'm I'm sorry that we haven't got more definitive news for you, but it has been quite a mission. Um, however, when this was presented to us uh, last week after an extremely heated meeting uh, with the Minister of Finance and his team, uh, they 
have come forward, as Harry said, with this compromised position. Uh, we initially were very against this because we felt that um, the middle, middle road where we were going to deal with 10% would give us time now to deal with the 90% whilst building confidence uh, amongst ourselves in government and with the international community. Um, and when they offered these two things together, we should know we would like to split them. They actually vetoed that completely. They were not interested in any way in vetoing, which also concerned us that uh, this was a confidence trick to get us to sign up to the, the uh, long-term bond for the 90%. As a result, we had a late, uh, very late meeting on, uh, I think it was Friday night, uh, with Washington, and um, they got this offer, and we said, please, pull this thing apart, and come back with, um, with your views. And they have come back with the views, and I'd like to read those views out. The farmers can make the best of a difficult situation by realizing that while they cannot obtain full compensation today, they can leverage the government's present political vulnerability to better their legal and financial position going forward. In exchange for extending the deadlines under the deed, the farmers should demand and indeed must demand the following conditions to enhance their position to relative to the current rights under the deed. Number one, enhance commitments to seek funds in capital markets. The government's current obligation under the deed, Article 3.1, only requires it to work together with the farmers to raise long-term debt instrument in international capital markets. Any new deal must include a stronger obligation that requires the government not only to continue cooperating with farmers, Can you hear me, Jim? <laughs> Are you buying lunch or dinner? Right, do you want me to start again? Okay, I'll just start from the enhanced commitments. Any new deal, can you hear me now? Any new deal must include a stronger obligation that requires the government not only to continue cooperating with farmers, but also to pay the farmers as a matter of first priority from any funds it obtains from the capital markets, whether public or private sourced. Correspondingly, the government must support the efforts to the uh, white paper Zadera to soften the Zadera approach with regards to raising money for the compensation process. In other words, if the government obtains money from the World Bank, to supplement its general budget or from the IMF for a specific investment project, the government must be legally bound to pay the farmers immediately from those sources of income in the forms of available cash or shareholdings. A new deal must include a firm deadline, e.g. two to three years within which the government must obtain new loans or capital to pay the farmers a certain percentage of the loans or be in breach of this agreement. Defined exit points. Any new deal must be framed as an interim arrangement to allow the government additional time to obtain significant funding in the capital markets. The inclusion of government bonds in the deal serves only as a window dressing to satisfy the government's immediate political needs together with those of the IFIs. A new deal must allow the farmers to exit the arrangement any time the government breaches its commitments, one of which must include raising significant funds in the capital markets by a certain date. If the government fails to make a cash payment in the first four years of the new arrangement or fails to raise significant funds in the capital markets by an agreed certain date, the deal is off. Therefore, the farmers will never be 
obliged to accept government bonds alone as the principal means of compensation. International arbitration. Under the deed, the farmers currently only have the right to bring the government to arbitration under domestic arbitration procedures, Article 12. Any new deal must include enhanced arbitration rights that it would allow the farmers to attribute, it, attribute a breach of the terms of the new arrangement, including by claiming the entire 3.5 billion owed in a safer, more effective venue for arbitration, such as the London Court of International Arbitration. A better arbitration venue and procedure will ensure that if the farmers choose to arbitrate, they are guaranteed that any favorable arbitration award will be valid and enforceable internationally against, the gov against international government's assets. On top of that, the terms and conditions of payment have not changed, uh, and this has been written now in the agreement signed off by the minister himself. The former farm owners will have to surrender their deeds of accession to a custodian of their choice, a trust fund or such, a trust, uh, lawyer's trust account or such thing, after the full settlement of cash payment of 10% of the global compensation value in year four. In other words, if they breach year one, two, three, or four, there's no accession. You've not, you have not prejudiced yourself in any way. Cash payments of 10% will be paid in any jurisdiction in United States dollars to an account of choice by the former farm owners. Any US dollar denominated TBs will be issued at a minimum coupon rate with the following features. Harry's discussed this prescribed asset status, liquid asset status, and tradable. No payments, and I repeat, no payments emanating from the bonds or other will be subject to taxation, including income tax, capital gains, and or inherent tax in Zimbabwe. The US denominated TBs will be redeemable and when additional resources become available to government, Additional resources will come from the sale of other government assets, as well as the proposed IATA fees to be levied on all air tickets for travelers to Zimbabwe and any sources which may materialize in the future. This is their, their conditions, not ours. They've included it. I just want to touch on alternative sources of income. Harry has touched on the, uh, on the Kavimba. The Kavimba is, is, uh, is, the story is well pictured at the moment and it's getting better as we get a, a, a better understanding. We've also put in the terms and conditions, we enhanced them yesterday with our lawyers, that any such deal with Kavimba must be given priority by our lawyers. In other words, they must have the mandate to, to sell Kavimba through their business partners. And I think generally we've got acceptance of that. The second thing, the IATA program, is the International Air Traffic Authority. Stuart Gunn is sitting in the corner there. I think he can uh, elaborate on that if he wants to. Every single air ticket in the world is controlled and issued and deducted through this organization so that airlines are guaranteed and countries are guaranteed that payments are paid from destination and or airlines using that destination. They have a program in place where a country can approach IATA and say we would like to raise capital by doing that, we would like to put a levy on every air ticket coming and going into this country. With their own stats, it is possible that they could raise, with a, with a levy of which they are discussing, $200 million a year through the IATA program. The New State Partners, based in London, who are the government's uh, uh, fundraisers or assisters, have said categorically that with the 200 million, they will be able to raise a long-term instrument on behalf of government for 10 times that value. So they believe they can raise 2 billion against the 200 million annual cash flow, of which then we will ultimately get paid. This IATA program, New State Partners are saying, will take up to 18 months to establish. That is part of the reason we've built in the stopgap 10% arrangement to allow this to happen. There are other assets on the table, some which government has yet to be mandated, but one is NOAC. Two weeks ago, uh, the Ministry of Finance was very confident that he could sell NOAC, and part of those funds could be directed to this. Um, he's since come up with some roadblocks against that because it's actually not his portfolio, it's Minister of Transport, but that's an internal thing which I believe 
can be sorted over time amongst themselves. So in my view, there's a real opportunity for us now to allow our lawyers, Aaron Fox, to negotiate a legal document on behalf of us with our input, obviously. Once that is in place, we would then like to hand that over to you, the farmers, to get a definitive vote of whether this is acceptable to us or not. I think for the first time in a long time, we have a little bit more leverage now. It's been an extremely, extremely difficult period. Um, we're dealing with a government which is under pressure. We're dealing with a government which is broke. We're dealing with a government that is going into an election which is challenged both internally and externally, and uh, the stakes are very high. So in our view, we've got to steady the ship, we've got to buy a bit of time, but we've not got to prejudice our rights in doing so. Um, I think, Andy, that's all I've got to say at the moment. If there's anything, people can come forward in there. Uh, I would like to give an opportunity for questions and uh, possibly comments. We have a mic here, and the, the team who are um, filming, putting the meeting on to Zoom, have a, if anybody wants to talk, if they can come and use this mic so that they can be seen on the video. If you are not happy to move or unable to move, we can give you a roving mic so that your questions can be heard clearly by everyone. So is anybody who would like to ask a question on what Charlie has presented, Harry and myself so far? Is it working? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vernon Nickel, for those who don't know me, and currently I live in Australia. I live in Australia, not by choice, but because I was thrown off my farm with nothing, and I don't want you to ever forget that. There's a huge number of us who live abroad who are unable to participate in this type of venture meeting, and I'm lucky enough to be in Harare today just to do that. I have one simple question to the board, please. We signed the compensation deed for a figure. In what's going on, how much will we end up getting out of that, or does that mean we will end up with less in our pockets? First question. How much will we end up? For example, we took that huge haircut you all have that paper on how much you're going to get. How much of that will we get at the end of this period of time? The, the, the objective is not to accept that bond. The, bond. the bond has been put in place for government to be able to satisfy their creditors that they have a long-term solution. We believe that if government performs and the, and the IOTA deal goes off and the Vimba sale goes on, you will get the $3.5 billion. Sorry? Uh, you, you, over the five years. The, the objective here is to get this paid as soon as possible. IOTA, to me, is, 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 is a, a non-brainer. We've got to go ahead with that. We proposed it, uh, we proposed it um, about eight, eight or nine months ago, this particular IOTA deal. But there was, a, there was a, a broker who wanted to, to be involved in it, and they weren't happy with the broker. But now, subsequently, uh, a new state partner said, look, you can do it without those guys. We will find a broker, and we will structure that. So we are not saying to everybody, this is a four- or five-year deal. The objective here is to buy the time, give the government time to be able to settle the, the arrears with the, with the World Bank, deal with the... the um, uh, Zadero issue, it's critical, we have to deal with that, and hopefully get paid long before the four years or five years. Okay, just so that I'll sit down and stop annoying you, the 10%, as I compute it, of the 35 million will give each person, because they're 4,500 farmers, approximately 7,700 US dollars. No, it's not 4,500, it's 2,600. Okay, do your sums, not a lot of money. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Um, thank you, Vernon. Um, anybody else like to come? Barry, do you want to come and uh, use the mic, please? I assume you can hear me. Gene? You can't. I'm a bit short for this thing. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you. First of all, hey, I think we all acknowledge we're all in the same team together. Thank you for everything you've done, what you're doing. Uh, but there are questions, there are queries that we have to ask. There are questions that we have to ask. Can I go straight to one of the most fundamentals? You guys are quite aware of this offer. You've discussed it, you've debated it. It's all new to us. Can we have a hard copy as soon as possible of this offer you're putting now? But we need it sent out on the Vulcan database to every farmer. We need it sent on the Vulcan database. Obviously, guys, this will help everyone make a decision and get advice. <coughs> That is critical. The document that is critical is the document that's going to be drawn up between government legal team and, and the, the um, uh, uh, Aaron Fox, our legal team representing us. That is the critical document. That is the only time that we will come back to you, to the farmers, and say, guys, here's a document. This is what it's all about. Do we go ahead? Okay. Or, uh, do we accept it or don't we accept it? That's going to take a couple of months. Right now, what we're wanting from the farmers, do we continue down this road or do we kill it now? Government's in default. They defaulted on the 29th of July. They've asked for an extension. We've asked them on what grounds do we give you the extensions? You, you, you haven't put nothing on the table. You haven't performed. You've done nothing. You've given us this now, which we'll take to our farmers and see if we can take this forward. Now, that is what we are asking the farmers. Do we kill this thing now, go back to government and say, it's rejected, and we're going to arbitration, we're going to win that. There are no ways in hell we're going to lose that one. We'll get the 5.4 billion, and that's it. We'll sit for another 20 years to see any, mo any more money. So they've put this on the table. So we're asking you for three things at this meeting. We did it yesterday, it, it was successful. One is, do we continue on, on this basis? Two. Zedera, it's an issue, and I'm sure it's going to come up strength five, and we will discuss it pretty, pretty firmly. And, and three is the extension. Now, what we are proposing to government is we're not prepared to give them a four-year extension, but we'll do it on a yearly basis. So if they perform the first year and they do the payments that they've committed to, we'll give them an extension for the second year, and that's how we'll proceed. Okay, thanks, uh, Harry. What I was getting can at I is we... Can I just comment here, Barry? This, yeah. we can, we, um, as I said in my opening ma remarks, apart from the, the first four years where we're going to get some cash payment, the bond is, is totally not workable in our eyes. Sure. If, we, okay. if we bound to this, we might as well chuck it in now. Yeah, sure. It's, it's all tied into what Aaron Fox have proposed, and if we can get that into a legal agreement with government that guarantees us exit points and all the other things that we want to bring in. We want to see the payments come forward in the original timeline of the deed is what we're aiming at. Whether we'll get there or not, we don't know. But if we don't try, we certainly won't get there. Okay, thanks, Andy. What I was getting at, Harry and Andy, was <coughs> with this impending referendum, what are you asking out of us? In other words, we're not going to be asked to give a vote until we've seen the structure here. All we want, all, all we want from the membership that we're addressing throughout is do we continue on those three bases? This is on the table. Do you like it? Don't you like it? Zedera, we have to get a mandate from the farmers for Zedera. And we'll explain why. And third is they want an extension. Okay. So if we reject this, the extension goes. Okay, I'm with you now. Um, it's just that, no, there was, we don't know what's going on out there. Were we being asked to vote on a referendum regards this without seeing in detail? No, okay. No, so just to clarify, all we're asking for is for 
a mandate to continue in our negotiations with government and to continue to get Oren Fox to negotiate with government on our behalf okay. and get something that is in line with what has been spoken of this morning. And then that will be presented to the farmers in with adequate time to get le legal opinions and so uh, there's no imminent and then it will be it will be a proper referendum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool, guys. That's uh, yeah. We just wanted to know that. Yeah. Good. Whilst we're bringing up that word, if I may, Chairman, here, Chairman, if I may, um, I've had discussions with some people here on Fox, Aaron Fox. Guys, I've got to put it to you, as one individual, I don't see why we have to pay five percent. The document, the initial agreement that was signed, was gross. When the government was going to borrow thirty, at least three point five billion on the market, they would be responsible for all financial costs attached. Then we got the Joint Resource Mobilisation Committee, which is you guys and government, and it turns out you guys, I think, found on Fox, but you're still the same team. Why are we now being asked to cover the financial costs, which are a region of about 175 million? <coughs> Barry, if they don't raise a dollar, they don't get a cent. If they raise $10, they'll get a percentage of that $10. They are not getting a flat rate of the 3.5 billion. I understand, but government should pay this, not us. Absolutely. And we, and, uh, uh, absolutely, and this is part of the negotiation. They've already agreed to pay 50%. 100%. I know. This is part of the negotiation package. Please, Charlie. Yeah, it's we, we, we're on the same page. I know we are. <laughs> so so I, I, it, it irks me that we've got to fork up money to get our own money. Yeah. So we're on the same page. Yeah, yeah, good. These are conversations that we have all the time. Thanks. Yeah, great. Because, you know, the deed is what we are basing everything on. And the deed does not say we are responsible for anything more. And it's a lot of money, 175 or half of that. And you guys, a Joint Resource Mobilization Committee, found this with government as their responsibility. Anyway, I'll leave that one. You mentioned that there are various documents that will be drawn up with this concept. Confirm whatever way we go or what's going on right now, the, <coughs> the deed, although it has lapsed, it will all be based on the original deed. Is that correct? As an addendum form. The problem being here, I see, <coughs> it's a dreadful deed. It's iniquitous. You've heard complaints about it. So be it. It's in place. We've suggested a lot of amendments that would be more favorable and protective to the folk. Here's an opportunity to put them in. Perhaps you guys are considering. I've seen you. You have put in the escrow facility, basically. Um, <coughs> if we, as per the last meeting when we spoke to the minister, and we asked for these amendments to the deed. And the minister and Andrew Bombe said they'd like to see it in the payment instrument, they put it, which would be the bond. Now, whichever way this goes, or whatever attachments is it, in law, as we know, the principal agreement will always be referred to. If we get arbitration in the future, the arbitrators have to consider the primary document the payment instrument will simply be a, um, a amendment, uh, sorry, addendum to it. So when they consider the arbitration, they've got to look at it in terms of Zimbabwe law. No matter what we have agreed on with government, the statute law, as we've always said, supersedes civil law. So we as civil partners, government and us, have agreed on, say, external payment or whatever. But the Zimbabwean law doesn't allow it. So what I'm getting at is that... Um, what the minister, if it got to that stage, what the minister and Andrew Wimber were saying, that they would put it in, 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 in the, the payment instrument side, yes, it could be useful in some arbitration, but generally, we could get bitten hard downstream because the primary document is what they arbitrate on. Okay, Barry, I hear you strength five. What I'd like to do, if you could make all these notes, anything that's concerning you, and I invite you to come with us to a meeting with Aaron Fox, and you put all this on the table. We're not lawyers. And I'll tell you what, any, there any constructive ideas, they will take on board, for sure. They are batting hard for us, these guys. And uh, I value that. I value what you're saying. Mm. Um, let's put it to them. Okay, Charlie, look, I'm not a professional, but I mean, I'm just giving some ideas out. It's concerns, because we could get bitten downstream. That's always been just simply the concerns. The other thing, if I might ask, sorry, I'm hogging the mic a bit here, but I won't be much longer. Um, <coughs> 
this four-year plan, 10%. Okay, I don't think you guys buy into this entirely, as you pretty much said. In fact, I'm sure you don't, because we could only just get 10% if it's not structured properly. In other words, the bonds, no, no, no. No bonds, no, no, not dressed up, no different forms. So they get our documents for four years externally, escrow. <clears throat> How will it be structured? Is that all about the simple 10% cash? Or does it also tie in with government's thoughts of a six to 20 year bond scheme. Sorry, uh, am I making it clear? Yeah, sorry, just a correction. There's no uh, deeds of session signed until after the 10% the ten is paid, the cash payment is fully paid. I don't want to give a letter of cessation after any 10%. It must be full total That's payment. You what am I missing here? You, won't, you, won't, you don't have to sign it. There's nothing, there's no deeds of session until the 10% is paid, and then after that, it goes into an escrow, after that. After 10% to an escrow, and when does it leave the escrow to government? Once you've been, you received your full and final payment. And is that interpretation based on this attached bond, or on the valuation? But how are they going to know about the bonds when we've cashed and not cashed in, or whatever? When will they demand this? Okay, I'm sort of thinking of the administrative side of this, because no, I've always thought no documents as one individual should go across to government or full final payment of 3.5 billion. And that we've got to make sure of legally, because interpretation could be held from a different view that hang on this bond thing, even if we look at it as perhaps a political useful tool at the moment, it could also be interpreted in law later on to be assumed payment. Because they issue the bonds straight away, don't they? Yeah. yeah, so the bonds could be then seen as full and final payment. So we've got 10%. Government turns around in law and says, but you've received the full amount because they're the bonds. Can you see my worry? Yes. Okay. Thanks. That, I won't hog it anymore. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Barry. Um, Sorry, who's that? Dave. Morning, everybody. Dave Wakefield, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and Committee. Uh, my concerns are that we've been two years down the line already and there's been a complete failure by government to perform. We, we have had two pretty good agricultural seasons. Last year they said it was the highest wheat we'd ever produced. Most tobacco and the maize crop were supposed to be incredible. The mining, the mining makes what mining in pre-independence time the minerals that have been taken out of this country now make previous mining look stupid. So what is happening to our economy that we continue to go down? John Mugudja, when he introduced the bond, put a big advert in the Herald. If this does not remain one dollar to one bond, I will resign. I still hear him as the governor of the Reserve Bank. You know, what, four or five years we've had bond now. Where are we going up? So anything that cannot be paid now, if the government wins the election, how are we going to turn around this country and this economy to get us paid? I think we're flogging a dead horse. They cannot perform. We're not going to get it. They'll give us our 10%, as Barry says, and I think that'll be the end of it because there is no light at the end of the tunnel. And for us to be involved in trying to encourage Zadera to be withdrawn and for that, I don't think it's us 
as a group of farmers who should be paying that. I'm sorry. The other thing is, the other thing is, the, all these bonds, the, the little money they've given out in those tranches, the three tranches, the third tranche, I don't even think the second payment has come, has it? Yeah, end of this month. This was, as Harry said, it might have been worth 20, you know, 20 million, but it's going to be worth 2 million or 2,000 2, rather, 2,000 instead of 20,000. So that's 10% loss since they said they'd pay it out. If, the, if there was proper governance and things were going up, we would have confidence. But I'm sorry, I, I don't believe there, there's that, uh, they're showing any, us any confidence in how they try and resolve this situation. We've been used as pawns to try and get them recognition to then do whatever they want. But I tell you, our interests aren't at heart. Thank you. Dave, thank, thanks for those. What government is doing with this money? Only they know. We, 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 can't, we can't make heads or tail, tails of it. Even new state partners, based on the information that they have been given by government to raise the funds to compensate not only the farmers but also to settle their arrears. With the numbers they've been given, it is, they, they are of the belief that government cannot afford to pay this unless they get external help. Aaron Fox went onto the capital market and they managed to raise the 1.75 billion which was due in July. The interest rate on that bond over 20 years, oh no sorry, it was, it was a 15 year bond that they could raise, was 20%. Now nobody in their right mind, no government in this world is going to accept a bond percent we are sanctioned. We are persona non grata. New state partners also raised the 1.75 in May because Mtuli went to them and said, you've got to raise the 1.75 before July so that I can make that payment in July. 20% again. Can't afford it. You, it's just impossible to, 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 to repay those. I mean, the, just the interest bill is 600 million. And you haven't, even, uh, you haven't even touched the capital. So it's not as though they haven't tried. But I, I don't know what government, we hear all these stories about minerals going out and diamonds and gold and everything you can think of. But from what the numbers that, and we've seen the numbers that uh, uh, New State Partners have given us. Government hasn't got the funds. I can tell you right now, his words to me last week, he doesn't know how he's going to fund the summer crop. He has a problem. He hasn't got the fertilizer. He needs to find funds to, to import the fertilizer. He needs, to, he needs to fund the farmers. He says, I haven't got it. So I don't know how we're going to grow the summer crop, the guys who are borrowed. So I hear you, Dave. Uh, there's a lot of rumors going around, a lot of uh, gold and diamonds and, that are flying out of this country. But do I know that? It's just what we hear. I think, I think we need to cover this a dear bit. Okay. Dave, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I, I can't agree with you more. Uh, but we're dealing with what we're dealing with, and that's what's on the table. And we're trying to maneuver to protect our rights uh, with, with, as well as trying to make a plan to move forward. Um, we, as, as Harry said, we can let it go to arbitration. Uh, we will win that arbitration. I have no doubt about that. Our legal team is very confident. But the problem with that is that it will be parked and we will never get paid. I have no doubt about that. The Zadera situation, there's, there's, a, there's a misunderstanding here. We are not taking on Zadera. It was never our intention to take on Zadera. What we did through our lawyers was to ask them to write to Treasury in the United States, asking them for assistance to pay the full 3.5 billion. 
They took that and they responded. And they said, we would love to help you. Exact words. Unfortunately, I haven't got the, the letter here. But it was something on the lines that we would love to help you and we uh, value what the government is trying to do and we agree with everything they're doing. However, our hands are tied because of Zadera. And this is exactly what Aaron Fox wanted them to say because they felt that the Zadera has an overreach, a constitutional overreach problem in that it determines the foreign policy of the President of the United States. And in fact, in 2001, when uh, George Bush uh, signed that uh, document, he was um, a Republican leader, but uh, the House and the Senate were majority um, um, Democrats. So he made a note, he attached a note to that, of which we have a copy. And he said, I fear that this may be um, a constitutional overreach, but he signed it anyway. That is what we're challenging. So it's our intention to ask Aaron Fox, if we get the go ahead here, to put a white paper together specific to the allowing us to raise the funds for the compensation process. It is not challenging Zadera. Yes, Vaynant. Vaynant, do you want? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vainant Hart. Um, I don't have to elaborate too much on that. Um, I'd like to deal with three issues specifically. The first one is the DERA, and I hear exactly what has been said, and I apologize if I repeat what other people have been said, but I'd like to follow a train of thought that would engage in a proper outcome. So the first issue of Zadera is, we look at what the name says, it's Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act. And, and the basis of it, its definition is, is in, in its statement of policy, which reads as follows, it's the policy of the United States to support the people of Zimbabwe in their struggle to effect peaceful and democratic change, achieve broad-based and equi equitable economic growth, and restore the rule of law. So the spirit of this whole act is what is important for us. And if I can simplify it to say that it is put in place to make it difficult for the bad guys to treat us badly and make it easy for the good guys to treat us well. That's the spirit of this act. And basically what it does it creates milestones on a road towards a fully functional democracy, identifying de uh, uh, progress into a functional democracy and rewarding it, not only with support, but financially as well. So for us to understand fully what that Zadira Act does, you have to read the act the full act, and I'm, I'm concerned that not many people have read it because once you start looking for it, you get the amendments independently of the main act. And then to add the two together, or the three together, becomes a very uh, onerous task and difficult to understand. But the big and important issue to understand in this is that the Zadera Act doesn't block progress in the right direction. And, and what I think, Charlie, you mentioned it, that they said that um, the a letter was written to the government uh, of the US that states what the intentions are. That's clear and that's great, and those intentions will be rewarded. However, it, it, it states here in, in the section three is that commitment to equitable, legal, and transparent land reform will be equitable, legal, and transparent means that we cannot be forced into accepting an illegal, unfair, and unjust agreement by the government of Zimbabwe. And if we are forced to sign that because we are hostages, the international community will not accept it. Therefore, to the best way to benefit from or to, to avoid the Im negative impact of Zadera 
is to abide by Zadira. And that is the biggest problem we all face. The government of Zimbabwe refuses to follow those steps towards a fully functional democracy. The second point that I want to deal with and like to mention to you is that this, this uh, solution that is being proposed and being worked on is a long-term solution. And a long-term solution demands financial discipline. And the government of Zimbabwe is notoriously famous for its financial indiscipline right from the First Republic into the current Second Republic. The Lima Agreement is testament to this and the lack of performance according to the failures of the government of Zimbabwe to comply with this internationally brokered solution should be sufficient warning to us that they cannot be expected to fulfill on any financial promise or commitment. Further, the proof of this is their inability to perform on the famous promise to retain the underwritten rate of the Zim dollar to the US dollar at one to one, a second failure of performance that inhibits the trust in any long-term offer. So what our negotiators should be looking at is not accepting any muddled and added com complicated solution. The law is quite clear. We should receive full, fair, and effective compensation. And unless we structure an agreement that contains those terms and conditions, it will not be supported by the international community, and we will never get our money. Thank you. Wayne, and thank you for those insights. Um, the difficulty I have is I look across this auditorium, I see people who've lost everything, and we're 22 years down the road. Zadira has been in place for probably almost that long. It hasn't benefited any of us. It's made life more difficult for all of us. We are not trying to get Zadira lifted. All we want is for a window, a gap, so that we can, we've had numerous um, plans, numerous uh, opportunities that were put in place. Uh, Aaron Fox have a, some an Israeli uh, OB projects management uh, team that work with them that came up with numerous possibilities of raising finances. Every single one of those had to be aborted because of the Zadera implications, which leaves us in a position where we are today, no money. We are not trying to change Zadera for whatever, the, part, the only re, all that we are looking for is a, a gap in it that we can get some money to pay the farmers who are so desperately needing it. Another 20 years down the road, maybe, possibly, we might see the political changes that are necessary for Zadera to be uh, um, recognized and implemented in Zimbabwe. We don't have that time. So our approach is not to get Zadera scrapped. We're not trying to, uh, we, all we're looking at is approach the Congress and see if there's a way that they would support someone who's trying to help us get our money. If there's a way they can do it, great. If there isn't, well, at least we've tried. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Bainant, you and I have had this discussion before, and I, I, I remember clearly. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can remember, I can remember clearly. <laughs> my, arm, my arms are short. I can remember clearly saying to you, we're looking for a gap in Zadera. Our, our mandate was to try and find a deal for the farmers that have been dispossessed. And that's all we're trying to do. We are not trying to, um, on the political side, we have no agenda on the political side. We have an agenda. Our mandate was to try and negotiate the best deal that we can possibly get right now. And that's what we're trying. Hence, that's why we've come to you and put it to you. If you want us to continue to negotiate, we will continue. If you don't want us to continue, then we go down the road, um, what Bainan's suggesting, that we leave it, we let it run its course, and whoever takes over in the years to come, hopefully it'll come right. 
we have always done it in good faith with the obligation that we saw we we're trying to get the best deal because we've got so many people that are absolutely desperate. And I tell you what, Andy was wrong when he said, look around this room. We just got to go to Dendara and places like that and see some of the people. You cannot believe. And uh, also the other thing was, you know, you, so the reports that we're getting uh, from various people, some people are really battling to live. And, uh, you know, we just can't live with ourselves. You know, you can stand on a principle here, but how, how do you live with this? But anyway, uh, as, as Harry, Charlie, and Andy has made it quite clear to our farmers, we're here uh, to try and find a deal for you. If you want us to stop now, no problem. We'll, we'll put it on ice, we'll go back to government, say the deals are off, we're going home. We're not interested. Simple. On the Zadera side, I heard what you said. I cannot comment on that as far as what it all stands for and what it's supposed to be doing. All I can tell you is we took advice from our legal guys who had constitutional lawyers in Washington and they fed us that information. We are not, certainly not clever enough to go into, into the legal side of things. So the constitutional lawyers from Washington came back with the thing and our lawyers in America has come back with it. So we were saying, and Ben, I've told you this before, we are looking for a gap here to get the money for the farmers. If we can get that reprieve, that's what we're looking for. Thank you, Vanet. And I think, I think Nick's covered it pretty well. The, we are not in, we're not in the politics issue here. But I want, I want farmers to understand one thing. There are 2,600 of us who own 4,000 farms. Government detractors, right now, I can tell you this right now, are saying to the leadership, why are you paying $3.5 billion to 2,600 Morungus? He is under enormous pressure. Trust me. When we signed that deed, we are told very clearly that the war vets went to him and said, you need your head read to even consider this. At the same token, when we talk to the international communities, they also say the same thing. Really? 2,600 farmers, 3.5 billion? We've got bigger problems in this world than you 2,600 farmers. We are on our own. Trust me. And we're going to do whatever we can to get compensation. If it means going to New York and kicking Biden's royal bloody balls in, so be it. But don't tell me that we should not challenge Zadera and get it softened so that our farmers can get compensated. Vanant, you talk about the politics. Let me tell you right now. One of the reasons that 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 Zadera was put in place was because of the way uh, the land reform was take, had taken place in this country. That very act is now stopping us from getting compensation. They're using it as a bloody excuse to stop us getting it. Wherever you go, IMF, World Bank, uh, the capital market, every single one says Zadera. We can't do anything, Zadera. And all we're saying, and Aaron Fox came up with the deal, said all we've got to do is present a white paper to the Senate and to the Congress and get them to soften Zadera so that the, you guys can get compensated. So we can all get compensated. I'm not interested in, in human rights and, and, and that, that's not my business. I want to see you farmers get paid. And that is my mandate. And I think it's everybody's here's mandate. Mr. Chairman, Mitch Green, ex Beatrice, Guibi student, Raise your hands, Guibi students. Lots of us here, lots of us here. First of all, I want to thank these guys for what they've done for us. Tireless work they've done. And, and those before them, who also, John Laurie in particular. Is John here? Not, anyway. 
Thank you so much, you people at the top table here. They've said to us quite plainly, we are here to decide whether we want them to carry on. If any of you previous speakers want to take their place, please do so. As far as I'm concerned, please carry on on our behalf. No one else is going to do it. There are very clever people here who've got lots of good ideas. They have not been at the front line. They don't know what these guys have been through negotiating with some very, very difficult people. Please, we need you to carry on. You've got my vote. You always will have my vote. We need you to carry on. Thank you very much, Jean. Would you like to... No speeches. 25 pages. Firstly, I'd like to apologize for um, interfering earlier on and saying, please speak clearly so that we can hear you. Um, but I was very pleased to see that the team toned it down and we could hear much more clearly. I'd also like to make an observation before I say anything here. And that is that we, can you hear me better now? I'm falling in my own trap. Um, I'd like to just say that after the meeting at Northside Church, um, this team here very bravely went to the Minister of Agriculture and said to him, Finance. sorry, Minister of Finance, and said to him, 1% 20-year bonds are a no deal. And if you don't like it, we will resign, and you can negotiate with the next team. And since then, they've had five offers from government. And for government are nervous, and they're worried. And this team here have told us that. So I know we all complain, and I know we all get on to all of the groups, and I know we give them a run for their money, but like the other guys that stood here before me, I think it's really important that we understand very clearly that these guys are doing the best thing they possibly can to help us. And instead of fighting them, we should be working with them. And sorry, my mom will say you're starting to become like a school teacher again, and I am. Um, I just want to raise a couple of issues, if I may. We have, over the past five years, come to two definite signed agreements with government. Number one was the interim relief payments for destitute farmers from the annual budget. Number two was the global compensation deed. We have about four and a half thousand title deeds registered with Valcon, and we have slightly less than 3,000 beneficiaries. Many Zimbabweans left Zimbabwe after being evicted in 2000. Lots of them went back to Britain, and they have been protected by the social welfare network there. And in 20 years, many of them have built up another asset base where they could. Those that went to America have had the benefit of earnings for 20 years, and they kind of are OK. The Europeans, some of them have been protected by the governments, and they are protected in broad terms by their beepers, the Germans, the Dutch, those guys. They are being protected by their governments, and um, at this point in time, those beepers are going to allow them to either have their land back or to get better compensation. The Australians and the New Zealand folks who joined the diaspora there, they have got earnings for about 20 years, some of them, and they have also got a social welfare net to protect them. The younger farmers in Zimbabwe and in South Africa, 
have been able to gain earnings in the last 20 years, and some of our children are doing quite well for themselves and are protecting and helping their families. But we have approximately 800, only 800, destitute farmers. And why do I say only that? Because those are the people that are registered on the interim relief payments for destitute farmers list. And they have signed an agreement with government that they will accept money which will be set off against the final compensation. That is an agreement signed and in place already. The interim relief fund has not been honored. Late payments, badly devalued, potentially over the last four years we should have been able to get 15,000 US dollars per person who was on that list. They didn't get that because it was devalued every single time. Even this last payment at our North Church um, meeting where you got home and you find $1.2 million sitting in your bank account, I'm afraid that was in very poor taste by government to do that to us. The global compensation deed, it's not been honored. They haven't paid us. They've had two opportunities. They're wanting another extension. And then at Northside Church, we were offered a 1% 20-year bond. And you heard me say there, Brigadier West had a 4% bond, 20-year bond in 1982, and he died destitute in his daughter's home in Durban. lest we forget. This new deal has no value and we have no trust in this government. Blackmail, threats, telling us that we've got to do this deal because of our destitute and our poor and our elderly, it doesn't wash, guys. That's 800 out of 3,000. And if this government had honored the agreement that they had signed with us for the destitute, we would have had $15,000 a year, whereas this $35 million a year for four years and the other balance paid in fifth year only gives maybe 7500 So just bear that in mind. And really, the rest of us would like to be paid in full for the values of our farms or the return of our farms on the same basis as the beeper guys are allowed to keep their farms. And quite clearly, government said that they are too scared to give the South African farmers back their land because there are too many of them. And the Mauritian farmers are coming to another agreement for their 61 farmers. They're going to be paid for their land and their improvements in terms of an agreement that was reached in July. The other BIPA agreement guys either get their land back or they get full compensation. And lest we forget, our farms are conservatively worth $30 billion don't forget that. Let's wait for a fair and reasonable and an honorable settlement. It will come in time. Bear with me, bear with me. This government is looking for a signed deal from us to take to their sovereign debt meetings with the World Bank and the IMF. Let's not take a bad deal so that they can go to that meeting. But let's come back to the facts and the reality. We can't say to the Zimbabwe government, go to hell, we don't accept your deal. And these men are right. We have to continue negotiating. We don't really have a choice. But we don't have to 
take a bad deal. So let's keep looking to see what kind of a new deal Aaron Fox and his their team will put together for us. And let's see if the Zimbabwe government will agree to it, because they might say no. Once we've seen that deed, then please, sirs, put together a referendum and ask us to make a decision on it. But before then, don't put your hands up this afternoon when they tell you to do so. Just nod gently to them and say, keep negotiating, please. Okay? I'd just like to make three other observations. Kuvimba, the legality of Kuvimba is in question. And Andy knows I've asked him to do the research on that, and he promised me he would come back to me on it. Okay, so I don't know that there's any money in Kuvimba. Arta, yeah, it's a good idea, but at the ARIC meeting, you promised us that that money would go towards a land payment. Okay. And Zadira? Bainant's right. And they have a very difficult decision. But we need to give them the space to make those decisions for us. So please, gentlemen, can you get the new deeds drafted and then can you sh let us see it and then make a decision? Can I answer that? Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, right in the beginning, we explained it to you and said we just want an answer from you whether we carry on or not. Let me give you the assurance right now from this team sitting at the top. No deal will be signed until it's been passed through our lawyers and it's signed again and then we bring it to the farmers to a referendum. So we are not, we are not going to leave here and say, oh, the guys tell us to carry on and then go and jimmy you behind your back. We said it the same at Chinoy yesterday. This is just to let us know whether we tell government to stick it up their kilt and we go home or we carry on and try and find a sensible deal here. But we will not do a single thing, and I want to say that again, we will not do a single thing until Aaron Fox has signed and made sure that the, the, the legal side of things is kosher and we as farmers are protected. We will then call for a referendum call the farmers, ask them to look at the documents and put it to the vote. That is the only time we will sign any agreement with any government. Thank you. Uh, Gene, yeah, thanks, thanks for those words. Um, you, there's, some, there's some things that you, you haven't actually understood. There is no other deal on the table. There's nothing. Uh, this is it. We have exhausted the everything. Uh, uh, microphone uh, sorry. work. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I agree with the previous speaker that we've got no option but to continue negotiations. But we must not negotiate from a position of weakness. We've already got a situation where for our farm improvements, we've accepted a 35% discount in US dollar figures. But let's for a minute look at US dollar inflation. As a correspondent on a, a platform that deals with this so aptly pointed out, that in 1902, at least 2002, uh, uh, a Toyota double cab bucky cost six and a half thousand. Now it's ten times more in US dollar terms. And now we are or again being asked to wait another four years plus five. In the end, we're going to get nothing. 
And I think we internationally can make noise, and I think we, it's time now, 20 years down the line, that we do start making some noise. But we must negotiate. George, as one of our elder statesmen, I, I hear exactly what you're saying, and there's no, there's no uh, argument to that position. In terms of international challenges, I agree with you also. I believe we've been kicked too long, and I thoroughly support those that are running these alternative initiatives outside. Why not you sitting there? Keep the pressure. It's good. Keep going. We've, we, we've, this is not uh, you or us. This is us together. And whatever we can do to, to keep the pressure on is the way to go forward. We, at the moment, uh, through Aaron Fox again, have initiated a, an investigation on the liability of the British government with, you, with respect to the land values of this country. Uh, we firmly believe, as do our local lawyers, that they have a definite obligation to deal with that second agreement, which is 3.2 billion, and very shortly, Aaron Fox will be getting all the information, we hope within the next week, of which is boxes of files, uh, and they will now determine a position on what they're going to do for us taking it forward. Uh, so we are going to start making noise. I think I'm sick to death of, uh, for want of a better expression, sucking the hind tit on this, and uh, we are locked in a position, we're dealing with um, a very dis difficult situation, we've got to keep it alive, we've got to stabilize it, but we've got to get the best deal and protect our interests, and I hear what you're saying. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? My name is Georgina Brown, and I come from Glendale. We were removed off our farms in 2002, and the CFU are fully aware of my situation and the story and the history that goes behind me. Firstly, congratulations, guys, from me. Yes, I think it's credible what you're doing, and thank you very much. I chose in 2002 to move away from the CFU and I chose to acquire compensation on behalf of my family independently of the CFU. I challenged the judicial system. I challenged, hello. I challenged the judicial system here. However, in 2010, I was successful and I managed to having complied totally with legislation to get the ministry and the treasury to pay my family out over one million US dollars in the lieu of compensation. So I do speak with a little bit of credibility. My issue here is in order to broker this deal, there is huge silence on the 99 year lease issue. It is something that is hugely significant and should be factored into this compensation deal. I have here a letter written to Andy yourself on the 11th of March 2021. The second paragraph, the ministry would want to speed up the process of 99 yearly lease issues to all former farm owners. One of the first things that Kubi said to us at Northside was the importance he places on the 99-year lease issue. I applied for land under the commercial A2 settlement scheme. I was given 196 hectares just down the road here on Calgary. I was removed off that. I was then asked to present my case to the Land Commission. It went through to the Land Commission. It went through three tribunal sittings and I was told that the chairman had agreed that I should be given an offer letter. That was in 2020. It's 2022, and I am still waiting for my offer letter. The chairman of the Zimbabwe Land Commission signs as the last resort the 99-year 
lease issue document. My case could have been fast-tracked and I could have actually been given an offer letter straightforward heading onto the 99-year lease issue. That has not been done. I believe in order to negotiate this deal, the 99-year lease issue should form part of it. The government will understand it. They just need to put policy in place in order to accommodate it. It might give us a little bit of leeway when coming to negotiate. Their backs are up against the wall. They have no other way out other than to turn around and say, up yours, we're not interested. Perhaps if we go with the 99-year lease issue as part of the agenda and say, Minister McCoot and Kubi, would you possibly consider something like this and factor it in legally compliant so that those people who would like to return to their farms or at least be given subdivision at their farms can, but they must be protected. Georgina, Johnny, Georgina, thank you, and you've made a very valid point. We have, what we've done, is we've rejected the 99 lease the way it is. We said it's not tradable, I can't sell it on, or you can't pass it on in your inheritance. So Prince Majaya has redone or rewritten the 99 year lease. What has helped us in this fight as well is that the beeper guys have been offered the 99 year leases and they haven't accepted them in the, in the state that they are right now. So we've made some good headway in that and the minister is well aware and so is the president well aware that th that is got to go down with everything else with um, you know if we want to secure farmers or farmers in the future they've got to go the, uh, the proper 99 year lease and everything else I don't know what to say to you about the offer letters because it's been a, a complete botch up the Ministry of Agriculture is, is something else to yeah it's, it's, it, it, needs a, it needs a massive explosion uh, and get some other people in there uh, we've done our nuts, we've, we've managed to change uh, one of the directors within there, uh, but they brought in a young guy and he's so intimidated by the elder guys that we've got a problem. Andy and his director deals with these offer letters, I think, on a daily basis. And he, he's the link man between the minister and that. And I know it's a nightmare, and it shouldn't be. I agree with you 100%. But you brought up a valid point, and we are working on the 99-year list, but we want the correct one. That's what we're working on. Uh, Gene, I, I need, I'm not letting you get away with this, because a lot of what you said <laughs> isn't actually right. One, one we, we, we part of, we're a beeper through my wife, a Dutch, a Dutch beeper. We've been monitoring the beepers very, very carefully to see what's going to happen there. At this stage, only 51 beeper farmers have applied to have their properties returned. And there's something like 260 odd beepers. Government has not got the money to pay those guys. I don't know what the Mauritians have done. I know they had a two day conference at the Meekles. And right now, I don't think much has come up. I know there's another one coming up, and I don't think much is going to happen about that one. But there is no money. Anyway, the Mauritians will get any money as if the Mauritian government pays out the farmers and gives this government a loan as the Dutch did with those 11 other farmers. That is it. We've raised this issue with all the embassies who have beeper status. None of them will entertain lending any money to pay us out. So it's up to government to pay us out. So when you say that we, you're going to get paid, it's not actually correct. And I know this has been said a number of times and it's said at, uh, at, at the uh, at the uh, the hall that we had the big meeting, I think it was, I don't know who it was, actually accused me of being a beeper and I'd been paid. Uh, I wish. I really do. The other issue, you say, don't sign this. It is not our intention to take this to 20 years. That's the last thing on our mind. What we are saying to you is, guys, government has 
offering 300, 350 million dollars in the first four years. That's what we're saying to you. You sign none of your rights away. We allow Aaron Fox to draw up the legal documentation to protect every single one of us. That is what we're asking. But what I'm hearing from Eugene is that carry on negotiating. Negotiate what? Or we can go back to them and say, we'll give you a, a, a year's extension and go home. Because there's nothing else on the table. There is nothing. It has been exhausted. Every time we've gone there, there's been a stumbling block. Not only from our side, but also from the international side. So what I'm saying to everybody here is take the 350 million. Let Aaron Fox protect us. We're not going for 20 years. If you don't want that, that's fine. That's what we are asking you. We will, if, if, if you reject the Zadera one, guys, you need, to, you need your heads red. You really do. Keep the politics out of this. This is not politics. We are trying to get compensation. And Zadera at this stage, they are using that as an excuse to stop us getting paid or raising any funds on the capital market for us to be paid. So think very carefully. Let them do the white paper. Let them present it to the, uh, to the two Senates. Let's see how they respond. It's unconstitutional under American law, what, what uh, George, uh, um, George Bush did. So let them do it. It's not costing you a cent. You're scared we might be aligned with this government? Really? We want our money, man. Come on, guys. Think about it. Barry, is that Barry? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to? Is it? Um, what's it in relation to Barry? Yeah, I think. Um, I think maybe what we need to do is just to, to begin to wrap things up. Um, you know, I think, I hope you've got the gist of what we're asking for. Um, the, there were three things mentioned that we need to get a, we need to get an idea from you whether we carry on with the, this proposal, getting, giving Aaron Fox the go ahead to negotiate, uh, to uh, work with government and put up something that, uh, come up with a legal document that will protect us but still enable us to get this 350 million um, without locking us into anything that we don't want to be locked in, making sure we've got exit clauses that are safe. And once that is in place, then that will be brought back to you. Um, you'll be given full sight of it before a referendum is being held. In order for that process to continue, we need to be able to give the government an extension on the deed. Obviously, the deed ex has lapsed and they have asked for an extension. What we are proposing is to give them an extension for one year based on their performance. If after a year they haven't met the, the payments that are due on the 1st of January next year and the 30th of June next year, then we know there's no point in even carrying on with the process and we can let the deed lapse and we can go to arbitration or whatever else we, want, we choose to do next year. But at this stage we need to get an indication from those of you that are here whether you're happy for us to offer the government an extension for a year um, and go forward with what we're proposing.
the expert in this thing, in law. Now that we are wanting to extend it, I ask the question, perhaps before we just vote on that, have you guys considered uh, some of the, not, not some, the suggestions for the amendments that would be put to government? Because it's simply so a law, eh, Andy. I mean, the, the fact that the conditions precedent weren't ever included baffled every single lawyer in town. You never have an agreement without civil uh, conditions precedent because they're simply performance clauses. And in the absence thereof, you don't have an agreement. So I know what happened, because if you remember, we were all talking together at the time, and government didn't want them. Well, that was a huge red flag, because you don't have a contract yet. So be it, let's move on to where we are now. With these extensions being offered, um, what you guys are suggesting, tied in with what you, the new, the new thing that we suggested, I'm just um, asking whether there can be amendments that would be brought into this deal, not in the performance instrument, which is the bonds. That's a separate issue altogether. And the final thing, Andy, sorry, on this one, is that um, in four years' time, assuming governments have paid us fully, as per four or five, I'm not sure what the thing is, are we then going to be locked into the bond thereof? Assuming they've paid us the 315 million, are we going to be locked into that bond? Because that's a core issue here. Maybe I've misunderstood. We don't want to get 10% and then the rest tied into the bond. So, Barry, yeah. Um, certainly, that's the exit clauses are the important part that enable us to exit without being tied into the bond and without having that safety net. There's no ways we will even bring it to you for a referendum. There's no point. We, there's no ways we're going to sign something that's going to lock us into a six or seven or nine or 20 year bond that government may not perform on. So that is part of what needs to be included in the legal agreement. And Barry, please, we would like you to join us in the next meeting we have with Aaron Fox and present what you are con your concerns. Be part of the process. Yeah, it's this out of most of the lawyers in Ferrari, our box, our lawyers themselves. Right? But we've also got some good brains here amongst us. Yeah. And uh, they're simply there to assist you guys in your negotiations and, and in the future give you strength. In the absence thereof, government have got all the strength. You are you're pretty particularly eloquent when it comes to talking about the legal implications and things. None of us are lawyers, I'm a farmer, I you come and join us in the next conversation. Make sure to uh, get across your concerns to them so it can be included in the, in the process. Thank you, Chairman. It would be wonderful to meet you. If we take with most of you, all you guys in the last couple of years. Perhaps a couple of us, or myself, or could meet with you and just discuss some of these issues which time doesn't allow now. Okay. It would okay. just make us more popular. Good. Okay. Yes, Dave. Sorry, Dave, that's what we're trying to avoid. That's part of the process to make sure that we don't get into that position. If we find ourselves in that position, we will recommend no deal. That's it. Okay, so we need to... Yeah, 
one thing also, we pro probably should have made it clear. N no one is tied into this. You, everyone's free to choose their own, their own road. And, um, you know, we're not, it, it's not a case of we signing up for everyone else. It's going to be everyone has to make their own decision. And at the end of the day, whatever we come up with after our, after our and Fox had, um, interaction with government, if it's not acceptable, it's not acceptable. So, um, but just, we need to, so, so we need to, I think the general feeling I'm getting from, from uh, the meeting is that we need to keep going. We can't stop. And have an option. <laughs> At the risk of being accused of uh, covert Stockholm syndrome, which is what uh, someone sent me a message over the weekend saying we can't expect people to vote in an open forum. Please just, keep, if, if you really are opposed to us continuing, maybe you should uh, raise your hand. In fact, let's just say yay or nay if you want, to, if you want us to continue. <laughs> nay if you don't. Okay, I didn't hear too many nays. We'll continue with the process. The other, the other important thing is that we need linked into this. We cannot carry on if we don't offer the government an extension of a year, and we will try and include all the, the other the amendments into our negotiations. And so, if we're going to go ahead, we kind of have to give the government that one-year extension. No so, if there's no amendments, then everything's dead, even if they're going to pay, the four, pay us 10%. They're monetary they're basic legal things, they're not different. Yeah. Uh, there might be a few which you guys might find tricky, but I promise you, a lot of those, they should not affect you unless they have no intention ever of paying. Yeah, okay, thank you. So, can I have a, a show of hands of those who support us giving them an extension for a year? We will do our best with the amendments and, uh, okay, can I see anybody, uh, the sh hands of those who are against us giving them an extension for a year? like to have an indication on, on the uh, white paper to the US Congress on a, to relax Zadera so that those that want to help us raise the money for compensation will be able to, able to do so. Can I have a show the hands of those who support that move? Okay. Can, can we see anybody who doesn't, doesn't support? thinks we mustn't. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So Dave, we, we, we are not the lawyers. We'll leave it with our legal team. They will know how to handle it, how to deal with it. They know what the mandate is. And that's, yeah. But thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. I think Chinoy was much more friendly to us. <laughs> but no, it was, it, the meeting went well, and yeah, I think the, everyone was, was very keen to see things continue. What I do want to add here, ladies and gentlemen, please, this is not a guarantee. As much as we would like to guarantee that government are going to perform, they've given us an offer, they're gonna, they want to pay 10% in four years, we all know who we're dealing with. We're just doing the best we can to give it the best chance. So please don't go and make plans to spend your 10% or get excited about it. This is a process that we hope 
will lead to something that will be of benefit to us all. Thank you very much. Sorry, I've. Hello. Uh, hello. I'm not sure anyone can hear.